Well, thank you very much for that welcome. I'd far rather stand at the lectern and orate to you, but uh, I'm afraid I can't quite do that at the moment. Now, I feel that I, because I'm speaking in a cathedral, I should begin my talk with a text. <laughs> and yet I doubt if there be a more reprehensible human act than to lead a nation into an unnecessary war. That was written a long time ago by one of the heroes of free trade pacifist England at the time of the Crimean War. There was no more reprehensible act than a nation to lead a nation into an unnecessary war. Well now I, I take this as, as my text because this is the subject that I'll be talking about. What then do I actually mean by unnecessary wars? Well, in many ways, I see them as wars of choice, wars that could have been avoided. That is, wars with people, wars at a time for a country that has no direct or immediate threat to its territory or interests. A war that is undertaken at a long distance from the homeland. A war in countries that are little known and understood. That is, I believe, that almost all of Australian wars were unnecessary. They were not forced on an unwilling nation. In fact, in most cases, Australia wanted to be involved. Now, in this sense, it seems that Australia must be seen as an unusually belligerent member of the world of nations. Let's just consider the record. Now, federal, federal Australia, the Australian nation as we know it, was actually born into war, the war in South Africa. <coughs> The six separate colonies in 1899 had gone to war with their own small contingents. And they all came together to become the Australian Army on the 1st of March 1902. And that, in a way, that decision was portentous because the, war, the, the Australian <coughs> Army was born overseas and it is largely fought overseas. And as many of you will know, it has done so many times indeed. Let's just consider the story of the second half of the 20th and the early years of the 21st century. That is, from 1939 to the present, in the 78 years, Australia has been at war for 60 of them. For 60 or 78 years, Australia has been at war overseas. We've been in war in the Middle East, been at war in the Middle East for the last 16 years, and there is no sign or any indication of when this commitment may end. Presently, we're at war in Iraq and Syria. We're going back into Afghanistan. We're beginning our involvement in the Philippines. Currently, there is a, an Australian flotilla steaming into the South China Sea to become involved in that complex story of, um, of a maritime boundary. It might have been thought that such a flotilla would have been better sailing to Bangladesh, carrying relief. And one must ask, where else might we be involved in war? Iran, Korea, Ukraine. So we have to ask ourselves, has war become more normal for contemporary Australia than peace? Does this make us particularly distinctive, aberrant, even belligerent? Could we go so <coughs> far as to see Australia as a rogue nation? That might seem a strange judgment. 
But just consider the situation of the world if other small to medium-sized powers like Australia and say there are 150 or so of them in the United Nations, what if all of them decided to behave like Australia and send their troops, their planes, their ships out on aggressive expeditions as often as Australia has done? Surely the world indeed would be chaotic. And yet, we seem to think that this is a perfectly reasonable and normal way to behave in the international sphere. Well then, in my view, there have been so many, so unnecessary wars, and I can't help asking why. Why is this so? Why don't we see this? Why can't we see ourselves as others must? And it seems to me there are two areas in particular that I'll concentrate on. One is institutional characteristics of Australia, and the other is cultural attitudes to war. Now let's consider each of those in turn. Now institutionally, it is very easy for Australian national governments to go to war. We inherited from Britain the idea of an untra untrammeled, untrammeled crown with absolute sovereignty when it came to war and treaties and external affairs. So as we know, the Prime Minister can decide upon war, take it to cabinet and then to caucus, and then to the bureaucracy and we can be in war. It might go to Parliament, but often it doesn't. No more than simply an announcement in Parliament that war has been decided. There are not the institutional barriers, the institutional restraints that there are, for instance, in the United States, or even in Britain, where there now is a very strong <coughs> tradition that a decision about war must go to the Commons. And as some of you will remember, the British government was unable to convince the Commons to get involved in Syria. Now, there are no such restraints on Australian governments. The threshold to war is extremely low. And at the moment, there isn't even the restraint of an opposition in Parliament because both the government and the opposition, like Australia and the United States, according to the Prime Minister, are joined at the hip. There is very, very little discussion about the ANZUS Treaty. It is simply unquestioned. So in all these ways, that is, in the way decisions are made, the way they can be pushed through, the fact that there's very little institutional opposition to stop this happening means that war is very easy for Australian governments to engage. And then war in Australia seems to be quite tame, not for those who have to fight it, but painless for the politicians who make the decisions for war. Let's consider just one example, that is the Second Gulf War. Now there is almost universal agreement that this was an illegal war. We also know that it was a political and strategic disaster. It was in so many ways a catastrophe the consequences of which we are still having to live. Now, two of the leaders who went to that war, Blair and Bush, have both suffered the consequences. Bush certainly has lost a great deal of credibility, but above all, Tony Blair has been totally discredited by going to that war for Britain and unnecessary war. 
And as we know, there has been a very, very long and very meticulous investigation by Chilcot, who has confirmed most of those views about the war. Not just unwise, not just imprudent, but illegal. What's the situation in Australia with John Howard? A buncular John. Why dog winter? Now he has expressed no regret, no remorse, no apology, and no one has called him to account on grace. And this takes us to another question, that is, why don't we have any assessment of our wars after they've been fought? We don't even, it seems, in public do a cost-benefit analysis. Every other action of government is assessed. Was it a good thing to do? Did we get value for money? War seems to be beyond these ordinary everyday considerations. We have no accounting for war. We have no consideration of how it happened. And above all, and this is the I find the most important thing, we don't seem to want to take any responsibility for the death and destruction that we carry into other countries. No moral responsibility whatsoever. Well, then I said that there were two ways in which it was easy for Australian government to go to war. One was institutional, the other was cultural. Now here I think we have to consider what I call the cult of the digger. As many of you will know, there has been a cavalcade of commemoration, at least since the early years of this century, which reached a crescendo in, 19, in, in 2014 and 2015. No other country that I'm aware of has spent as much on commemorating the First World War as Australia. And the extreme folly, in my view, is spending $100 million on a museum in northern France to commemorate Australia's fighting in that terrible war. Now beyond that, beyond that, is the argument that is now overwhelming <coughs> and ever-present and ubiquitous that Australia as a nation was created at Gallipoli. The nation was born at Gallipoli. Children all over Australia now believe this because that is what they're taught. And Brendan Nelson can say, can say without any embarrassment that it is the war memorial that is the soul of the nation. And even further, the, the, what is implicit in this record, what is implicit in these views, is that war is the ultimate test of both nations and men. It, it was that our men were tested and came out superb. We showed that we were a nation and they were truly men, that war was the ultimate rite of passage. And even further, even deeper, is the idea that despite all else, war can be a creative force. Now that seems to me to lie at the heart of the Anzac legend. Now those views and that rhetoric were still possible in 1915. But most countries, by 1919, had given up that romanticism of war, which is certainly apparent in the early years of the 20th century. I think there is still an element of romanticizing war in the Australian rhetoric and in the Australian cavalcade of commemoration. And in so many ways, it is an idea that is perpetually repeated because it is a bunch
above all the children who are inducted into this cult of the digger. And in so many ways, this puts all the emphasis not on why they fall, but how they fall. And if you ask how they fought, it doesn't matter what they were fighting for, you can still admire them and say they were worthy, worthy of the Anzac tradition because they were truly manly and heroic and courageous and they believed in nature. And in so many ways, that's why we don't really assess in retrospect whether our wars were a good idea. Because that questions the behaviour of our men. That questions the behaviour of our men. When the last soldiers returned from Iraq, Kevin Rudd was in town, he was asked, is there going to be an investigation of why we went to war? And he said, no, 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 we can't do that because the, our return people are our, you know, our, our people have just returned and we don't want to disturb them. So we have nowhere have we done any assessment of whether that war was a good thing, whether we got value for money, whether it was a, a terrible thing, and we take no responsibility for the consequences of the war that we became involved in. <coughs> now, in so many ways, I think Australia caught war. War doesn't come to us, we go to war. Now I was profoundly reminded of this when I read a statement that appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald in September 2013. I didn't read it at the time, I read it subsequently. And it was a statement by the new Minister for Defence, Senator David Johnson. He'd only just been given the portfolio, although apparently he had been uh, a long-term advisor to Tony Abbott about the Fence matter. This was his first public statement as the Minister. We must assume that it had been checked or even written in the Department of Defence and it represented the view of the Defence establishment. This is what he said. He wants the military to be battle ready for future conflicts in the unstable Middle East in our nation. And he even said, well, we, it could be Pakistan. They're a bit unstable, we may need to go there. And he said, after 14 years of involvement in overseas conflict from East Timor to Afghanistan, the ADF has a strong fighting momentum that should not be lost. So rather than saying after 14 years of war, perhaps we should come home, he said we mustn't lose the momentum. He went on, he planned, he planned to maintain and augment our readiness for future fights. Operationally, we're starting to come down in Afghanistan, so we've got to maintain some interest for the troops. Now, I found that an astonishing statement. An astonishing statement. And I presume many of you will too. That is, he clearly wanted a new war. He wanted a war of his own. But more than that was the sheer ass assumption that Australia, in advance, had a legal and moral right to intervene on the other side of the world. The other thing that astonished me is that it created no controversy. As far as I could tell, it simply passed unnoticed and no one found this to be an extraordinary statement as the opening salvo in the career of the Minister for Defence. So let me move on to my conclusion. I think we really have to wonder whether we're destined now to be always at war. Always involved in unnecessary wars. So 
I will begin, as I, I began with a text, I'll now conclude with a poem. A poem, part of a poem, written by the American poet Robert Lowell during the Vietnam War. And Lowell said he feared for his children and grandchildren, and I quote, who would fall in small wars on the heel of small wars until the end of time to police the earth. Now, if we are to avoid endless engagement in unnecessary wars till the end of time, we must indeed fight for peace. And I'll just con conclude with a quote that I only found a short time ago because it was a quote from Albert Camus, which Ralph Sonny is apparently <coughs> used quite often. Peace is the only battle worth waiting. And that, I think, is a battle that all of you will be very happy to engage in. Thank you very much. artist at Jim Barna, a creative cultural design agency. Thank you. Hello. How are you going? Um, before I start, as per protocol, and as um, I'd like to firstly thank Uncle Bob Anderson for, for his powerful uh, welcome to the country. Uh, before I start, as per protocol, a protocol that has been in existence for more than 60,000 years and bears great significance to the First Nations people of this country, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country where we meet tonight. I acknowledge that this country here, as well as the country throughout this continent we now call Australia, has a rich and sophisticated history with knowledge, law and stories embodied in thousands of generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, providing context for here and now. I respectfully acknowledge our elders before us as the story holders of the past. I, respect, I respectfully acknowledge our current elders as the story holders of the present. I respectfully acknowledge those that are emerging and peoples of more recent arrival, particularly those of more, particularly those of more recent arrival that have supported First Nations peoples historically and continues to support First Nations peoples to regain equity and peace in our own country. My name is Jai Lawton. Through my heritage and genealogy, I'm, I'm a descendant of the Bidjara people of Central Queensland, with Scottish heritage of the Mackenzie clan in Scotland. I'm both honoured and privileged to be delivering this vote of thanks here tonight. And now I will throw a little disclaimer out there. Um, I do feel like a teenager that's about to go on a first date with the high school crush. Um, <laughs> haven't been a long time fan of, Profe of Professor Henry Reynolds' work and, um, and <coughs> it's actually quite surreal to be here. So um, it really is a, a, an honour and a privilege. Nonetheless, before I attempt to articulate not only the greatness of this man that has just spoken, Professor Henry Reynolds, alongside the important role his work plays, I'd like to make a few remarks, or, or more so, reinforce um, um, a lot of the stuff that, uh, that's been said tonight. Firstly, the 229 year history of the colony now called Australia is not one of peace, not one of rejoice, and not one of harmony. It is one of bloodshed, war, state sanctioned massacres, forced removal of children, and ultimately genocide. And we're not even scratching the surface. And as a result, it has created wounds that are still fresh and open and far from becoming scars. 
And that concept, I think, is quite an important one to consider, particularly in, in light of warfare. Um, and so, um, and I invite each, each of you to think of it in the context of trauma inflicted to First Nations people and where we are currently at as a nation in healing this trauma. By definition, wounds are, are a significant blow inflicted by trauma, and a scar is a mark left from a healed wound. What we are talking about here is not ancient history by any means, and significant work must continue to be done to heal those existing wounds that form scars. The second point I'd like to make is First Nations people in this country make up roughly around 3% of the population. And if my mass is correct, that leaves the remaining 97% being non-Indigenous. So as First Nations people, we can't do it on our own. And we need strong allies in the form of people like Professor Reynolds, whose ideology is bound tightly with ours. The work that Professor Henry Reynolds does in this space has, has substantial impact in transforming the social landscape of this country for First Nations and non-Indigenous people in sharing the true history of this country. We shouldn't un underestimate the impact that the truth in one's trauma has in terms of the process of healing and in turn peace. The beneficiary of such progression is not only equity for First Nations people in this country, but also perhaps today's modern society can learn a few things from a culture that has developed flourishing societies for more than 60,000 years when the values of our culture are embraced and not ostracised. So I not only thank you for your speech here tonight, but from the bottom of my, of my heart, I thank you for the work you have done and continue to do through meticulous and factual account that allows the process of healing our wounds into scars. Thank you.